Awesome. Oh, hi, everybody. How's it going? Oh my god, I'm a little nervous, I'm not going to lie. <laughs> um, I'm so thankful to be here and uh, very, um, I think, humbled is the word. <laughs> um, no, it's, it's, it's kind of surreal, honestly, because I like, grew up in a trailer park and I was homeschooled. I've never even went to a school except for well, Beverly Hills High, um, but that was on camera. So, um, and then I, I went to drama school. I didn't go to college. So to kind of be that speaking here in front of you guys makes it's, it's a kind of a, it's a dream that I wouldn't have dreamed to dream come true, if that makes sense. Um, so thank you for having me. I'm, I'm really excited to talk to you tonight. I, it's still evening, so this evening, um, but, um, I just want to say, I, we had a little meet and greet just now, and I really am so just inspired by all of your energy. I love doing these talks because you guys are at the best part of your life. It just starts to suck after this. So, no, I'm kidding. <laughs> um, you don't have to do charity laughs. I've been informed by a lot of my British friends that apparently I'm not funny. So if I am say a joke and it sounds like a joke, but it's not funny to you, don't feel bad for the poor American. You can just not laugh. Um, was that a charity laugh? Okay. <laughs> anyway, so um, yeah, I'm going to talk a little bit about. Well, I'm going to talk about my story, and I'm also going to talk about what what means more to me than anything in this world. Um, the calls that's very dear to my heart. But um, to get there, I'm going to take you through um, some ups and downs and it's a little bit of curves because my story is kind of, um, I got to kind of start in the middle and then work my way backwards and then work my way forward. So if you, if you follow along <laughs> or if you're not following along, you can um, just yell at me or something. I don't know. Um, no, you guys are way too proper for that, right? This is Oxford. Um, okay. so. Some of you probably know me from 90210. Um, on that show, I had five years of being Queen Bee. I was popular. I won prom queen. Even when I didn't win, I thought I won, and then took, took, took the crown and all kinds of crazy things. Um, experiences that, again, a homeschool girl never would have had. I was actually a nerd. Um, maybe you don't believe that, but I am kind of still a nerd. I listen to neuroscience lectures and reading books on psychiatry, psychology, and neuroscience in my, in my off time, which tend to be when I'm on long plane rides, 11 hours to here would be one of those times. I got through a couple books. Um, and my experience uh, portraying this popular girl was so not my experience in life. So um, it's an interesting arc for me as a person. But what happened in season two of my, uh, of my show was shockingly similar to what happened to me in real life. And I had no way of connecting the dots. In season two, my character was raped. And the showrunners came up to me and they were like, we have a very serious conversation that we want to have with you. We're going to do this storyline and we need to make sure that you're okay with it. Well, I had already been working with an anti-sex trafficking organization, um, the one that I work with, I'm president of today, for, I guess, three years at that point, going on three years. So this was just like, come on guys, this is what I talk about every day. Like I'm always talking about these issues. You know, this is an incredible platform. I was so excited. I read all the scripts. We did all the episodes. We went into season three. I was portraying the aftermath, which working with trauma victims and personally being a trauma survivor myself, um, the aftermath is way worse than the incident most often. Um, PTSD is something that stays with you for the rest of your life. Post-traumatic stress disorder, you have triggers that send you from zero to 100 in, uh, on an, a Richter scale of anxiety. And you don't know how to cope because you're experiencing what in neuroscience is called implicit memory. And explicit memory is memory that allows you to actually chronologically date and time so you know this is a memory, but it happened on my birthday, July 16th, 1993, when I was turning six and I was happy. You know, like your brain has that capacity, but then implicit memory is something that happens when your brain cannot help handle what's happening. So it does 
one of two things, one of a few things. It disassociates, it shuts itself down, it, it, the excessive amount of adrenaline and cortisol that's produced due to anxiety makes it go haywire and it can't do the typical filing process that Chris would probably be good at because he's on it. He's a filer and a planner and an organizer. I'm not. I'm so not structured, so I'm really thankful that Chris handled all of my details. Um, but this, this particular incident, uh, implicit memory, it's kind of, if you imagine a feather floating through the room and then someone turns on a vacuum and it sucks that feather right up, that's what it feels like to go through a PTSD trigger. And it's instantaneous, it's intense, it's full on, you don't know what's going on or where you are. And this happened to me. I was on set. We, like I said, we had filmed so much of the storyline, it just, it's crazy to think about now, but I was in, in real denial. Denial in, in psychology it happens when the brain decides you cannot cope with this information, so you are going to not remember it. That's it. It's just gone from your memory. You don't have it. You can't access it. You aren't pretending. It's just not there. Uh, my brain decided that for me. My brain decided that I couldn't cope. And a lot of my trauma and a lot of my abuses were blocked out. And, and to this day, there are a lot of things that have happened to me that I don't remember and hopefully will never remember. Um, but in this particular incident, I was on set and we were filming a portion of my story and now I'll go back in time a little bit to what happened to me. I was raped when I was 18 years old. And I like to preface this by saying I grew up, I was 15 years old, I, was, uh, I, was, I graduated high school at 15 when I left home. Um, I was, the homeschool thing allowed me to kind of control my academic situation and I cut out extracurriculars and just decided I wanted to get out of town because being at home was not, I wanted to go for my dreams and I wanted to, um, I wanted to get out of the situation I was in. So I went from being a preacher's daughter, which is, okay, maybe you guys have not heard cliches about preacher's daughters, but they're kind of like Catholic girls, and no, I'm kidding. Um, I'm actually not kidding, that's completely true. So I went from being a preacher's daughter in a little small town in Georgia, then the South in America, to New York City, and I was suddenly in a group of models, beautiful women who are allowed free access to any club, anything they want, anywhere, anytime, and I loved it. I wore the shortest mini skirts you can possibly imagine. I actually chose this really inappropriate outfit for my speech tonight, and I'm wearing some knee-high hooker boots. They're Stuart Weitz Weitzman, so they're not exactly hooker boots. Um, but it was on purpose because I, danced on tables and didn't wear underwear and did all these things that you should never do if you don't want to get raped. I took the trains home at night because I didn't have any money. I, by myself, um, never got raped. I was sexually assaulted in my own home when I was 18 years old by a friend who was crashing at my house. And that, I was the statistic. 80% of the time, that's what it is. Someone you know. Um, he made me a statistic. I say that because I don't believe people have the power to do things, to take from you. In most of my life, I choose everything. I am proud to be a strong woman, but he made me weak. That was what happened in that moment. That was the worst rape I could have ever experienced not brutally, being violently. I was so disconnected to my body, even the sexual aspect of what I felt didn't really rate to me because I had experienced a lot of abuse in my life and people were allowed to physically abuse me. I was sexually sought out sexual abuse. I, I always needed to feel more. I need to feel more to actually feel anything at all. Um, but what he took from me, I couldn't get back which is that I thought I was strong, and I thought I was this independent, tough woman who played these strong roles, who took no prisoners, and, and didn't care what anybody thought about her, and walked into a room like she owned the place. <coughs> and after that night, I spent the rest of my life trying to prove that I was still strong. 
because I didn't believe I was anymore. Because I didn't do anything. I didn't fight back. I didn't move. I just laid there and let him do what he was doing and pretended like I was asleep. Ten years later, <laughs> literally this year, like he, actually here in England, um, I was reading one of my crazy neuroscience books because like I guess that I'm a nerd and I'm also crazy. And I was, I had the biggest discovery of, like I read all of this so that I can understand what's happened to me. I had one of the biggest discoveries of my entire life. I learned about something called the dorsal vagal system. And this is really boring for most people probably, so just tell me to stop talking if you want me to. But I think it's really cool, okay? This is an ancient survival mechanism that is common in reptiles. It renders the prey completely lifeless so that the predator thinks they're dead, so that hopefully they'll move along. And it tends to be um, prey with predators who like live feed. Like, you know, so basically it shuts, it does a system override and shuts down the entire system of the reptile. Shuts down their lungs, shuts down their gut, shuts down their cognitive processing, whatever their reaction, their typical reaction. It does the same in humans, and that's what happened to me. I didn't fight back, not because I'm weak. I am a strong woman. I didn't fight back because my body said, you can't take this. You're not going to survive this. You could die. There's no telling what he'll do if you fight back. There's no telling what he'll do if you run. I'm going to shut you down so that you don't even seem like you're alive. And then you'll get through this and you'll keep living. Because survival means to live after the death of, to continue living after the death of. So I continued living. It wasn't a life, it wasn't quality, but I continued living. I now know that I wasn't, that he didn't take my strength from me in that moment. But that's 10 years later, so you gotta imagine I went through some, some really not fun stuff. Um, in, when I first admitted to what happened to me was 10 months after the rape. Because I was in denial, my brain had decided to protect me, I acted like it didn't happen. I got up, I you know, got in my car, I went to my meetings, I went to a dinner, I just left and wanted to leave that night behind me and continue on with my life. The, the whole night would come back to me 10 months later when the guy who raped me decided that it would be a good idea to tell all of our friend group who I was no longer hanging out with because I didn't want to see him, that I was in love with him. And I have a friend who is literally like a big brother to me, and if any of you have big brothers, they antagonize you, and they give you so much crap, and they like pick at you, and, uh, and they, know your, they know your way, so they know how to call you out. And Kirk thought he was calling me out, and he was like, I know why you don't hang with the group anymore. You're in love with him, talking about the guy. And I was like, no. <laughs> and I'm pretty good at like covering my emotions. I, I tend to like think that I'm a steel vault when I want to be. Um, there was nothing that I could have done to, to cover what I was feeling in that moment. Supreme panic. Absolute duress. And my whole body got hot and, and anxiety and I like just, you know, was panicking. And to him, it looked like I was just lying. So he's like, yes, you are. You're in love with him. You're in love with him. You're in love with him. And he kept going and kept going until I finally, just to relieve the pressure cooker that was becoming my body and my brain, just screamed, no, I'm not in love with him. He raped me. And it was the first time I'd ever acknowledged what actually happened to me. Cut forward to, like I said, four or five years later on the set of 90210, I've gone through this entire setup of being so excited to do the, the, all of this storyline and everything. I've shot multiple episodes talking about the topic and portraying the topic and portraying the rape. And now I'm in the aftermath and my character's name, Naomi. Naomi is just trying to get through insomnia, like not sleeping at night and nightmares and flashbacks and all of this. And then she enlists the help of one of her friends, Silver, and in the hallway of West Bev, um, we filmed a scene where Jessica Strout, who played Silver, had to confront me about what happened to me, about what happened to Naomi. And we shot my close-up, a setup for one scene can take four hours. So we'd shot me, we'd shot the whole master, the, like, the whole room. 
and they turned around on her and then that's when the actress actually starts acting. They don't care about you when you're on your close up. They're like, oh, I'm like, okay, what are, what are my lines? Hold on. Oh, did you need a cue? Hold on. Hold on. Sorry, line. Um, and then it's like, oh my God, it's my close up. Can everyone shut up? <laughs> you know, this is, this is actress 101. Um, no, Jessica Strapp, you're so not like that, I love you. Um, I just remembered that this was being filmed. Um, <laughs> anyway, so um, she just started really hammering me and her lines were, you, he didn't rape you, you're in love with him. You're in love with him. You're in love with exactly what happened to me. And in one moment, everything came back. Standing on the set, in the stages, my workplace, my place of work, my home for five years, this perpetration on my person came flooding back into my world. And I burst into hysterics. Um, the things, anxiety, the implicit memory, the feather being sucked to the vacuum, it all happened in one moment. And Jess was like, oh my God, thank you so much. You were so giving on, like, it wasn't even your close up. Like, oh my God. She doesn't talk like that either. That's really rude. I keep remembering that I'm being filmed. Um, but I, I make light of this because this is a topic of conversation that's not fun to talk about, right? We don't like talking about rape. We don't like talking about sexual assault. We don't even like talking about sex. I like to say, I love sex. I didn't like it the night I was raped. Because we need to have a conversation about this. We need to make this a topic that we speak on more. And, and I'm thankful to see in, in the last, uh, I guess, well, 10 years, especially when it happened to me, I certainly, there was no one out there talking about it for sure. But in the last five years, we've really seen people start to be able to feel like they can, they can speak about this. But imagine what it's like to be in the worst, most embarrassing and intimate moment of your existence, right? Like, think about your most embarrassing moment right now, everybody. Just like, close your eyes for a second. What's your most embarrassing moment? And now think about your most intimate moment that you've ever had. Now imagine telling the person next to you, or me, or just saying it out loud to someone right now. Just blurt it out, like, your most embarrassing and most intimate moments right now. Um, no, don't really do that. It's not cool, it's not fun. It, it, it's, we don't like talking about these things. But the most powerful things in the world and what, what Oxford is all about is an idea, right? The idea around sexual assault and the idea around uh, women's issues in this regard, I call them human issues because I think we're all just humans, just, you know, you can bury me later, but that's my opinion. Um, is that we need to talk more. We need to share an idea. And if the idea is that we don't speak on this topic, then that's the archaic idea. And you can't, you can't kill an idea. You can only replace it with something better. So the way I talk about it is how I dress does not mean yes. I have the right to be a sexy, beautiful, fun-loving, powerful woman who dances on tables if she feels so inclined, even though apparently I can't dance either. Some of my friends also told me that. Um, but I have that right, and I have the right to do that without being violated. And without being put, without the idea being put onto me that that is why I got myself violated. We need to speak about this topic more. We need to change the idea. So this takes me to my, my most important human moment that I had was, I was being offered 90210, and I said no. <laughs> Probably wouldn't have this turn out if I had stuck with that decision. Um, I know that I definitely am very thankful for having done the show now. It's given me an incredible opportunity to engage with individuals like you guys. Um, but I didn't want to do the show because I was miserably unhappy. I hadn't come to the awareness of what had happened in my story. I just knew that from the time I was nine years old, I knew what I was going to do. I grew up in a trailer park. I didn't know anybody in Hollywood. There was absolutely, positively no way in the world that I was going to be a success. Everybody told me to have a plan B, and I informed them at age 10 that my plan B was that plan A would never fail. Um, I was an arrogant little kid. I gotta tell ya, not a lot has changed. 
I'm really arrogant still. Um, no, I, but there's something that I really want to touch on very quickly, and I know we're going to get into questions and answers and stuff. Um, is this, this, all of these moments happened in my life not because they were these horrible moments and they shouldn't have happened. Yes, if we could go back and change any bad moment in our life, of course we would, in theory. But I wouldn't be me. I wouldn't be here at Oxford talking to you if, if every single moment in my life up until now had not occurred. So I'm thankful that I was raped. Because I have spoken to thousands of other survivors like me who have let me know that I'm not the only one, that I'm not alone. And that's what the world to me is about. It's about reminding ourselves that we're not alone, that we're not different, that we're really all the same. We all have big dreams. We, you come here and you're studying what you're studying, and I know that you all have big dreams. Lolly and Chris, we, Harry, we all talked about that today uh, at lunch. You've got plans for your life. You know what you want to do. I'm here to ask you tonight, do you know why? Someone has a call, and they better know why, and it better be important. No. Um, that's called being human. We all have cell phones. I don't get bothered by that. But what I do get bothered by is what's without whys. And I had that. I, I knew my what. I knew what I was going to do, and I knew how I was going to do it, and I hammered, and I nailed, and I killed, and I did it, and I didn't stop until I succeeded, and I was miserable because I didn't know why. When I turned 90210 down, I learned some very powerful negotiating skills. If you say no in your future job deals, you'll get more money if they really like you. Um, that was not what I was doing, but I learned that at 20, and I was like, oh, let's say no every time. Um, I like money. Um, but so I learned some powerful things, but I said no again. I said no three times. Um, so yeah, I had a little nice little ego going on there. I was like, oh, they want me. No. <laughs> Come on, no, <laughs> no. Um, but I really, that was not my headspace at the time. I can laugh about it now, but that was not. I was really genuinely unhappy. And I got on the phone with my, <laughs> my acting partner from New York, who's my really good friend to this day. And she's like, like everybody else, congratulations, I'm so happy for you. And I was like, if one more person says congratulations to my miserable life, I'm going to kill them. And she was like, okay, hey, just the messenger. Um, she and I have a you know, funny sense of humor that's not funny, clearly, because no one laughed. But whatever. Um, anyway, she, she was appalled by my stance on this. I was adamant. I, I, all my friends know I get into these little moods where you cannot convince me otherwise. I have an opinion. It is right, unflawed, and it is the way that it is going to be, and the world can just stand back and watch it happen. And she was like, oh God, how am I gonna convince her that she's being a complete moron? Um, so she didn't try to convince me, she gave me an alternative to my choice. And the alternative was the why that I didn't know that I needed to know. She asked me to get on a plane and come to Cambodia, and I did. I got on a plane, went to Cambodia, and met survivors of human trafficking who had been w through a hell of a lot more than me. And they were okay. And I looked at them, and I started to see that maybe over the course of the last eight years, maybe I could be okay too. And now they're my why. They're why I do everything in the world. They set me free. And, and I speak at colleges and, and talk on this topic a lot because what I want to promote is what they gave me. I want to set you free. And maybe you don't need the freedom that they needed. Maybe you're not enslaved in a brothel in Cambodia. But I came to Cambodia a slave, and I left a free woman, because they gave me what I never knew how to, to find. They gave me the awareness that I already had the key. And when I say we're enslaved, seven billion people, we talk of a lot, they're talking a lot in, about Cambodia right now. I'm so thankful to Ashton Kutcher and, and, and obviously Angelina Jolie. She says 17 years ago she went to Cambodia and it changed her life. Same thing for me just eight years ago. Um, 
There's, it's a magical place. If you ever get a chance to go, I, I hope you do. But the girls loved me, and I didn't think I deserved to be loved. I didn't think that anyone would love me. I didn't think I was lovable. I struggle with worth issues, feeling that I'm worthy. And they said I was worthy. They just love me for who I am. And, and I, I fought it. I didn't know, I didn't know how to take it. I didn't know how, when you're abused, you just believe that anything good, is, it's got something attached to it, uh, and it's coming for you. So don't, don't bite. Don't, don't bite the bait, because the hook is there, and it's going to get you. And, and so I, I was a runner for most of my life. And they taught me that I maybe don't have to run. Um, and I'm still learning that lesson every single day. It's not, it's not something that you, oh, like I just got it, and now I'm here to speak to all of you and tell you how you can be like me. Fantastic. Um, no. <laughs> it is a every single day thing. But I was enslaved in my mind. I was raped one night, but I was ra raped a million times in my mind. We do this. We do this to ourselves. We enslave ourselves, and we throw away the key. I am so thankful to be a part of the beginning of your lives before you've had too many people coming in to recommend how you can enslave yourself, which they do in really flashy, cool ways. Like, you should just tell yourself that you're lame and you don't deserve this. And you're like, yeah, I am lame. I don't deserve this. And then 40 years later, what, what were you talking about? We were talking about 40 years, 40 years old, and you're, you've lived this whole life, and now you're, you know, having the, the midlife crisis and going to date the pool boy and dumping the husband, or well, I, I think it's actually the other way. You dump the wife and get the bond bombshell, but, you know, I didn't want to be sexist, y'all. Uh, we got enough of that going around in our world, so um, I don't want that for you guys. I don't want that for me. I want to be free in my mind every single day, and how do you do that? You have to first realize that you're enslaved. You have to realize that your society, your culture, your religion, your school, your peers, your parents, everyone is here to tell you something about you, about what you are and what you aren't and what you can and what you cannot be. But you're the only one who gets to determine that. And the second that you allow their voices in, your voice diminishes. So I want to raise my voice with you and help you raise your voice for yourself and make sure that if you're free right now, then stay that way. But if perhaps you've got some, some voices in there that tell you that you can't or that you won't or that you're unlovable or that you're not worthy or that you're gross, which I felt about myself for a long time, that I was detestable. I want you to see that you have the key and you don't have to feel that way anymore and you don't have to believe that. And those shackles on your mind can be freed just like shackles on the wrist can be freed when Somali mom, the hero who saved my life, rescues 7,000 girls she's rescued in Cambodia and throughout Southeast Asia. It's, we're, a, we're a world that needs to fight slavery from the inside out. And that is what my, that's my why. So I'd love to hear from you guys about what your why is. And um, what, what time is it? Did I talk too long? I talked really long. Oh, my God. <laughs> um, and that's, yeah, so uh, that's my thing. That's my stitch. Thanks. I was, um, I was looking around uh, the chamber as you were talking, and I could clearly see that what you were saying resonated with quite a lot of people. And I don't know how much you know about sort of like the environment Oxford creates, but I know that Oxford has a, certainly has a really bad mental health problem. And one of the biggest barriers that Oxford puts up is the fact that we have these eight weeks, very intense academically and personally terms, uh, where people feel like I can't deal with my personal problems now because I have to get on with my academic work and, and concentrate on that. Uh, how would you respond and advise those people who are thinking, oh, I have all this on at the moment, there's no point even approaching or thinking about approaching my personal problems because of this intense term I have? I think that's a very Oxford particular problem. Um, well, that's a great question. And, and that, doesn't, <laughs> that doesn't stop when you leave Oxford, <laughs> just so you know. It only <laughs> gets worse. Um, no. <laughs> um, what, you just, just go to a new level of problems, right? Um, 
we, we all have those moments in our life. And, and the most, we were talking in the little meet and greet earlier, the most important relationship you will ever have with anyone on this planet is the interpersonal relationship that you build with yourself. If you do not take care of you, nothing else that you do will ever have the longevity or, or the success or the outcome that it could have if you did. So if in the eight week period of time when everything's going to hell in a handbag, uh, you don't take care of you, the, 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 it'll show in your grades, it'll show in the, the, you know, the, end all, the end result. But in order to address that, which is the actual question that I realized that you just asked me, <laughs> um, in order to address how to go about that, it's, it's very simple, it's not easy to apply because it's not the way that we're taught things. We are taught from a very young age to basically that selfish is bad. That's, that's what we're taught. Self-centered is bad. Self-centered is not a positive, in my opinion. And again, there's something that you should all know. Don Miguel Ruiz says it. I love him. He wrote The Four Agreements. If you have a chance to read it, it's an incredible book. Whether you like philosophy or not, it's, an, it's a very interesting ideology. It changed my world. He says, do not, do not believe me, do not believe you, and do not believe anybody else. What do I believe? Whatever, whatever is actually the truth, it will survive all of your skepticism. For a long time, we thought the world was flat. <laughs> the world was never actually flat, just so you guys are aware. Even those years and years and years where we thought it, it was still round. It was round, round, round. But we believed it was flat, so it was flat. Our reality, what we project, is what we experience. If you project that you can't handle your mental problems or your family problems or your this problems during an eight week period of time, then you won't be able to. Those who say they can and those who say they can't, they're usually right, right? I think someone smart said that, Confucius, was it? Um, possibly. <laughs> so, so that doesn't help you in day to day because it's like, yeah, 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 thanks for the great talk. I need to go do my exams now, lady. So here's how you can apply that. Removing the belief that, that, that there's something wrong with being selfish is the first step. S selfish is the most important lesson you can learn to exist in this life. If you're on a plane, they tell you, please put your oxygen mask on first before helping someone else. It's really annoying when you've heard it nine million times like I have. That's why I have these amazing headphones that are Bluetooth wireless. Um, but there's a really great metaphor because you know what happens if you don't put your oxygen mask on before you put it on someone else? You have 12 seconds with oxygen deprivation before your brain shuts down. You will tell your hands to move and they won't move. You will not have the ability to control your body function. It is very important that you put that oxygen mask on yourself first. That means be selfish first. Then you have something to give. You can give life-saving oxygen to someone who hasn't, in that 12-second period of time, been able to do what they need to do because you now have taken care of yourself. In the most important relationship in your life is you, right? That's, that's getting to know you, building a connection with yourself, stop being a douchebag to yourself and saying all the things that everyone else said and is up here and listening and believing everything that this thing says to you. Learn to be selfish. And in that process, what will happen is that you will know yourself. I know me, and I have my friend Allie, <laughs> who Chris loves. Allie and Chris are like two peas in a pod. They helped arrange this whole thing for me, and they are just amazing brains that I cannot figure out because they are so put together, and I am just not that. <laughs> I'm a lot of things, but that's not one of them. I am not structured, I'm not organized, my, I'm a hot mess. But I mean well, and I've got a big heart, I will say that. But Allie, <laughs> Allie doesn't like 
something left unresolved and and when she senses that I have I get I get into my head a lot I'm a big thinker I'm an overthinker I analyze a lot and when I'm in a mood it, it, it makes her crazy like she can't figure out it didn't fit into the itinerary I wasn't supposed to have a mood at 2 30 p.m. why do I have a mood Annalyn why do you have a mood and I'm like I'm in a mood Allie um, but my point for saying this is I know myself and, and she'll be like, I don't want you to be angry at me. She said that to me before. And I'm like, I am angry right now. And I will continue to be angry until I'm no longer angry. And at which point, when I am no longer angry, I won't be angry anymore. And you will be the first to know. And <laughs> I sound like a really mean friend. I know. I tell people, it's like, I'm not easy to be friends with. But you always know where you stand with me. If you know where you stand with yourself, then others can know where you stand. And, and when you're in a situation where you've got eight weeks to do something, you set your priorities and you make that happen. If, if, if your priorities mean not handling the problems in your life that you need to be handled, it's, it's just a matter of communication. Just tell the truth. Everyone is human. We're all human here, right? You get, there's no aliens in the here, right? You guys are all from planet Earth, yes? Oh my God, this is really crazy. No one said yes. <laughs> Wait, I thought I was talking to Earth people. Our Earthlings, report, please. Um, we're all human, right? If I tell you, this is my dream. This is my dream to, to, to accomplish what I'm gonna accomplish here at Oxford. And in order to do that, I've got eight weeks of cramming and I'm gonna not respond to text messages that well. And I'm gonna not be online that much. And you're not gonna see three Instagram posts a day. You might just see one. Like, <laughs> people will receive that. What they don't receive is, oh my god, well my phone like fell in the toilet at the restaurant and then I forgot that it was uh, the restaurant that I went to yesterday because I just realized that I posted, oh god, I posted, but I posted from my iPad the Instagram that I posted because they're going to know that I, there's, you know, you go through all these like lies that you can make up or why you can't handle something or why you can't do something. It's okay to, to put things on the back burner. Communicate, t be honest with yourself and you'll be honest with others, and that's how you get it done. Does that Thank you. help? So on the flip side of that question, um, maybe some people in the audience have friends who um, they, they believe that they need to help, and like, how, how would they approach this? Often people, when they're anxious or when they have personal uh, issues that they need to deal with, they'll push people away, mm -hmm. and that can be difficult for friends as well. How, how, do you, how would you advise the best approach um, friends who might be having personal problems or issues. I, I have a tendency to be a pusher of people away. I admit I'm guilty of this. Um, everyone has their process, right? The, the answer to everything in the entire world for me is one thing, love. Not, not hippie tree hugging, even though I live near Venice in California, I'm not talking about going to Burning Man love. I'm talking about what love really is. Love is what I experienced in Cambodia. Love was, I am flawed. I am not perfect. I make mistakes. I disconnect. I push away. But you don't judge me for that. You let me do that, and you're still my friend. You can take a step towards someone. You can say, I'm here for you if you need me. But there are people who process without talking it out in a friend group and singing Kumbaya, oh my God. But there are also people who <laughs> send in a friend group and sing Kumbaya, and that's also awesome. Um, but knowing that just because someone has a different way of processing something than you doesn't mean that everything needs to go to hell. Like, okay, <laughs> like, I also happen to not like anchovies on my pizza. Are you going to lose it if I, like, don't eat anchovies around you because you like those smelly little fish? Like, you know, don't put it on my pizza, I swear. If you want to share a pizza with me, you need to just, like, have that on the side in a different dish. Those things are nasty. But my, my point is pre respecting someone's preference by just loving them in real love, it's full acceptance. Say, that from my outside opinion, you look like you need some support right now, and I want you to know I'm here to give it to you. And then, it's their life. It's their, it's their life, Charlie Brown, what my dad says, it's your life, Charlie Brown. Being able to be in a connection with someone and not have to force your agenda is something that very few of us are able to do. We're so afraid, we're so afraid that if it doesn't go the, to plan, 
then something wrong has happened. Maybe something right just happened. Maybe you just learned that plan isn't always what it cracked up to be. I'm not talking to you specifically, Chris. <laughs> no. It, it's, it's having a plan but being flexible. So if, if your plan is to help your friend and the way that you help them is by leaving them alone, you need to know that about them and respect that. Okay, thank you. And so my last question before we open up uh, to the audience, because I'm conscious to give you guys as many as opportunities as possible. What's next for you both personally and professionally? Oh, I was hoping you guys would take me here. Like, I study <laughs> neuroscience at Oxford with you guys. Um, no, uh, you know, I, I'm really excited about this period of my life. I took over as president of Together One Heart last year. And Together One Heart is my anti-human trafficking organization. And I've been working with this ground team with Somali Mom and her team in Cambodia. They've been on the ground for 22 years. Um, in November of 2015, they asked me to be board chair and president, and I said no. Not because I was negotiating and thought I'd get a better salary, I'm not being paid. In fact, I think I paid to work for them, I'm pretty sure, with <laughs> how it amounts. Um, but I, I'm the first one to say yes to everything. Like, you know, whatever. I just, I like to show up, I like to do crazy things. But I know what, I know myself, and I know what I'm capable of, and I know what I'm not. I don't have the skill set that this man has. I don't have structure. And for me, in my head, I thought they were asking me to be executive director. I thought they were asking me to run the organization. And I knew that someone with my brain can't do that. I can speak on behalf of the organization. I can, I can raise funds. I can raise awareness. I can inspire. And I can educate. And I can bring you to Cambodia and show you why it's an incredible, incredible organization to work with. But, but the day to day, I'm not good at that. I, I've got a crazy career that is here and there, and the schedule's insane. And um, they came back and explained to me, no, 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 we're not asking you to run this. We know, you crazy girl. Um, we just want you to do what you do well. Talk. As you can see, I talk a lot. Um, and, and I... I was scared. I don't get scared of a lot of things. I, I like to say I fear fear itself. If, uh, if if I fear something, then I go face it head on. I, I, I don't want any fear in my world. But I was scared because I value these little humans so much. I know them. I know, I know their names. I know their dreams. I know the, you know, some of my little girls want, want to drive sanitation trucks. Like, they, they have dreams to be nurses and doctors and teachers. A lot of them uh, want, to, want to, you know, own their own hair salons or, or be seamstresses, and they all want to hire other survivors. And they're three years old and five years old, and I've held them in my arms, and I've rocked them to sleep, and I've fed them. And I, they're my babies. They're my kids, you know? And, and I didn't want to let them down, you know? I didn't want to say yes to something if I wasn't the right person for the role. And my entire why, my entire world had become this, right? So my, when I said yes to being president, I took it really seriously. These are lives that I'm holding in my hands. And last year kicked my ASS. Can I curse here? Yeah. Kicked my ass. Oh my God. <laughs> I learned so much about just things that I wouldn't even have known to know about. And it was the best decision I've ever made. So I'm going to continue being president of Together One Heart as my number one role. I'm, I'm mommy number two. Somali mom is mom number one. And the girls told, called me mom number two on Mother's Day a couple years ago. So I moved from bong Rai, which means uh, big sister, to mother number two. So now I've got even more responsibility with these little buggers. Um, they're wonderful. But they are crazy, too. Those little, they will run you ragged. Um, but I, I, my number one priority is making sure that every two months I got 60 grand wired to Cambodia so that they eat rice and they have their college scholarships and, and they have what they need to, to be the little women that they're going to grow into. And, and obviously with acting, you know, I just finished Secrets and Lies, which I think will be coming out in the UK um, this year. Um, and, and kind of a, took a bit of a back burner with the whole acting thing last year because of the taking on as president. It was, you guys take a year off to do president, right? It's full on. So I did a little bit of a year sabbatical myself in that regard. It was an everyday process of learning the ins and outs and, um, 
And so now I'm, I'm back in and, and ready to go. I've um, got a film opening at South by Southwest, uh, one of our film festivals um, in, the, in the States in March. So um, that'll be coming out in the kind of a limited release, but will probably be one of my fun little cult films that I did. And um, I've been looking for the right show. I want to get back on a show. I'm ready now. It's, I've kind of done like a year here, a year there, a little, very non-committal. Um, but I'm, I'm ready to get back on a show and, and, and do something th of merit, do something that I'm really proud of. I'm, I'm thankful for 90210, but I want to do something that has a, a bit of a voice within the show itself. And, and I think that 90210 definitely had its moments, but let's just be honest, it's a little bit of a guilty pleasure. Um, and I love a guilty pleasure, but I, I definitely would love to do something political. Okay, great. Okay, if we're going to open up to the audience now, so if you have a question, please raise your hand nice and high and wait until a microphone uh, gets to you. I ask that your questions are quite concise. Um, okay, so we start uh, just at the front here in the orange one. Hi, um, you said that you didn't like the use of the phrase women's issues and you preferred human issues. Um, I suppose in that vein, what do you think about the, the phrase feminism and do you think it's still a useful term to use nowadays and would you call yourself feminist? Uh, it's a fantastic question and one that I'm very happy to answer and discuss. I, I believe that the word feminism has a negative connotation for all of the people who don't like to actually use the dictionary. Um, the dictionary is pretty specific about what it's about. Um, and uh, the dictionary definition, I absolutely am. I don't use the word because of the negative connotation and, and I have very specific reasons for that. One being, yes, I, uh, the, calling the humans is, human issue it became very important to me as I worked through my issues with men. I, as you can imagine, <laughs> had a few. Um, so I was, I was very, I, I was the negative connotation of feminist. Um, and I think that's why I hesitate at using it in, in the world because I don't like it and because it reflected a poor time in my life when I was quite unhappy. Um, now I am very, uh, very thankful and, and want to be openly grateful to the majority of men, um, the men who actually deserve the title of man. Uh, I like to say that men don't rape, men do not abuse, men do not uh, perpetrate onto women all of these, these horrible violations. Cowards do. Men are actually pretty awesome. <laughs> I like them. I like you. Um, <laughs> um, there, the, there needs to be a bridging of the gap, and that's why I don't like the word women's issues or women's rights. I like human rights because we're human and we're in this together. And I have never had more support than I've had from my male friends, and, and I've never seen more waves made in fighting this cause than when a man gets up and calls another man out for what he's doing to a woman that's not okay. And so for me, it's, it's a return to the roles in a positive way. Um, the, the lines have been blurred, and, and I think that a lot of guys, and I say guys because I'm talking about this generation, don't know what they're allowed to say or do or they, without feeling like, oh God, is someone going to get mad at me because I made a joke about the woman being in the kitchen or, you know, like something like, oh my God. Well, you know, I actually like cooking. So like I'm in the kitchen sometimes, oh God forbid, you know. I happen to also be a, a world traveler and a, and a working girl and, and have, you know, uh, aspirations to dominate the world, no, um, but, but I also cook, hey. So I, I think that uh, we were talking about this in the meet and greet, evolution versus revolution, that's what I support. Um, I, I support every woman who feels that she needs to get out there and use her voice, but I would ask that she would sit, remember to say thank you too, because there's a lot more men who are standing there beside you silently supporting you, not asking for credit, while you're slamming 
men in general for the bad ones who, what, in talking college campuses in the United States, one out of five girls are sexually assaulted. 90% of the rapes are committed by 10% of the men. Who's saying thank you to the nine out of 10? You know what I mean? They're the ones standing there supporting us and, and we're kind of not giving them the credit that they deserve, that, that we do have an alliance, that this is not two sides of the aisle. So that's why. Thank you for the question. Thank you. If we come down to the front here. I wanted to know what you think you learned most while playing Naomi on 90210, um, and also who are some of your inspirations? Absolutely, thank you. I learned how to dress better. Um, <laughs> Naomi knew how to dress, that girl was great. I actually am still really good friends with, uh, with the costume designer because she, I mean, she hooked me up, I won't lie. I went home with some boxes full of awesome clothes. Um, but you know, I learned a really crucial lesson. Um, obviously, the show was d drama, right? <laughs> there was there was a there was definitely an un a tone of drama on and off the set. So I learned very quickly that <sighs> stick to work. <laughs> work is work. Okay. <laughs> when you start trying to go in there and we you know think that everybody has to to be friends or you know or or everyone needs to agree, I think, is the problem. We all get, we have an opinion. It's not good enough that it's our opinion. We need everyone to agree with us. Like, I, I'm cool if my opinion is the only person in the room, that ha I'm the only one. Because I am that solid in my opinion. And, and I learned to be solid in my opinions in the world uh, from working on 90210. And one of the things that I learned was, in a way, my own talk about women's issues, so to speak, um, the female dynamic in the workplace, I was experiencing what maybe women, um, you know, have an issue with um, in typical work settings, but more so not, I don't think because I was a woman, more so because of my age. I felt that I was being treated in a certain way by certain uh, members of the powers that be, like I was an idiot. and. I am blonde, and I was born in the South, and I'm Southern, and don't mistake my kindness for weakness, and don't think that this blonde makes me stupid, honey, because I ain't stupid. And I was, I remember three years in, um, I'm a big person on principle. Everything to me is about principle, about integrity. It's like, I don't care what you do. You can tell me the worst possible, most horrible thing you've done, but if you tell me the truth, I will respect you. And I was constantly being lied to. Like it was like from like we're ready for you on set and I run to set and like all my co-stars are still in their trailer. You know what I mean? Like no, like my I that I'm still being filmed, right? Crap. Um you guys are awesome. I love you. No, but um well we we all experienced it. I, all of my co-stars did. And and it's something that's very common actually. They're used to actors showing up late, so they lie to you and tell you they're 20 minutes early that they're ready and they're not. But I value the truth. And, and I'm in an industry that fakes everything. <laughs> um, and year three, I, I did a film that really, between year three and year four, I did a film that really mattered to me. It was a, it was a cult film. I played this weird, strange little person who was completely opposite of Naomi. But it was an opportunity for me to be an actress, to like really, you know, stretch my wings. And they cleared me. They said I was good to go. It was all good, and then 21 days into a 28-day film shoot, I get a call from 90210, and they tell me that I'm no longer cleared, and I need to come in and do a hair and makeup test and, and a read-through. Not production, not actual filming. Um, just like makeup and hair. I'm like, guys, you know what I look like in hair and makeup. I've been doing this for like 68 episodes. Like, come on, are you kidding? No, I'm gonna finish my film. You told me I'm cleared. And I learned quickly that Hollywood protects their own asses before they protect you. And, and I had been someone who, from the, being from the South and being taught to be kind and polite, and I said yes to everything. If they asked me to do something, I did it. I did all my own stunts. I did any press that they asked. Everyone was having a problem with this or that or something at some point. Someone didn't like the hair. Someone didn't like the makeup. Someone didn't like the... 
I didn't complain. I showed up on time every single time. Like we had people who were like literally a, a van had to be sent two hours like after their call time to go pick them up at their house and knock on their door because they like didn't show up at all. Like I'm like the the actress who's like you know doing it. I thought you know like respectfully doing it right, and I I was getting I was getting screwed over, and I learned that. The most crucial, literally, the second to maybe my negotiating skills, <laughs> I learned that you have to come in and set a precedence. And the precedence is this I am really nice right up until I'm not. And when they screwed with me, I screwed back. And then I screwed harder and longer, and it wasn't fun. And my point for all of that was I don't want to be put in that situation. But if you make a promise to me, don't, they never had to clear me for the movie. But they told me that I was clear for the movie, and then they uncleared me when it was too late and I was already invested. And this meant the world to me to do this project. So I learned to come into a project, learn, come, to, come into a room, come into a relationship, come into anything that I do and set a precedence that I'm a little crazy, so don't play with me. I'm like, you don't know where I'm gonna go. Like maybe it's all funny and I'm just silly, or maybe I'll kill you. Um, no. <laughs> but there's, there's something about knowing what you're bringing to the table, and I know now what I bring to the table, and I know my worth in career. I had to learn it as a person, but in my professional world, I know what I'm worth, and I don't accept less than that treatment. And what I told them to their faces was, I had, I had become a diva. I, I did, did everything that I ever heard. I locked myself in my trailer, I stormed off set, I made a scene, and I got my way. I got everything I wanted. And I got in their face and I told the producer, I said, let me tell you something, I will do this every single day for the rest of my series, okay? If you don't take me seriously, do not lie to me. If you don't want me to do a film, and I, you have the right, I'm signed in a contract, I respect where I sign my name, I won't do it. But if you tell me I'm free, don't lie to me. Don't come back and say that I'm not. Don't tell me the camera's ready when it's not. I don't care what you tell anybody else, don't lie to me. And that's what I, I learned that I needed to let people know early on who I am and what I'm about. And that, they, that I respect my job, but I will not tolerate being lied to. And that was, that I, that's carried into my life and who I've become. And I think that you know, it was a very powerful lesson for me. Thank you for a great question. Before we have time for one more, um, if we go, uh, it's the hand just on the edge there. Hi, um, thank you so much for your story. It is very empowering. And um, I just wanted to ask that before you have come across the miracle life changing point of your life in uh, Cambodia, have you seek or did you seek professional help in terms of when you're like really down and when you're really unhappy? Or did you just carry on with your like prioritize your work? And what if some what if people with like mental illness with mental illness who you know, um, who are enslaved with, by their own voices can never have those miracle moments. What, what do you suggest them doing? Do you suggest them like create these, uh, create, try to like create these miracle life changing moments themselves or how do you want them to like, you know, persist on? Can we be here for like the next week? I love these people. <laughs> that was an amazing question. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, you know, I suffer from mania. Uh, my family has bipolar, and most of us have it. I have what's called hypomania. So I tend to exist in my manic state, and I dip into my depressive state throughout the year, and sometimes I rapid cycle. Um, I was severely suicidal as a result of not just my trauma, but my brain. Um, I still have suicidal thoughts to this day. I know now not to act upon them. I did try to kill myself in Madrid about uh, seven years ago. I uh, used to cut up my arms, slice them up, knives, um, due to this thing that, that can be my greatest asset and my biggest curse. And 100% I did seek out help. Um, I will say for me personally, 
what has changed my life and my levels of anxiety, uh, which I also suffered from extensive levels of uh, anxiety, uh, both social and generalized. I don't have that anymore. I can never sit in a room and do this without panicking uh, the way I used to be. I would be sitting here thinking about everybody in the room and what they're going to say about me later and if they could take this out of context and like oh, if they're going to use it against me or like there's some crazy conspiracy ulterior you know motive for bringing me in here just to tear me down like I would have these crazy thoughts and what for me personally has changed my life and it's why the neuroscience study and, and I am I'm obsessed with understanding my brain is meditation Mindful practice, um, I read Don Miguel Ruiz's Four Agreements that I mentioned earlier, and then I bought every book that he's ever written um, because that started the process of changing my life and having those miracle moments on a daily basis. I, I don't, I'm not saved from my brain. I work with my brain all, every day, all day long. And before I came here, I was having a little anxiety attack up in the room. Like, I'm like, I'm going to go and speak in front of a bunch of people at Oxford. Like, they're going to think I'm crazy and I suck. And I was walking, like, pacing back and forth like a mad woman. Um, and I was just walking through my brain through it. I'm like, what if I was in the audience? How would I be feeling about the person speaking? I wouldn't be there trying to make her feel uncomfortable. I'd be there to listen, right, to learn something. I'd be there to see what she has to say. Maybe that's how all of you guys were feeling about me, and I'm thinking that this is like some ominous room that I'm going to walk into, and I could possibly just do the, you know, most embarrassing thing in the world, and it all goes to, you know, uh, it all goes to hell. And and so I was working my, through my brain, and I literally talked to myself like, like a crazy woman would. <laughs> I say, I'm like Annalyn, what's going on? You're okay. You're going to go out there and talk about what you love with people who are going to love what you have to say or they're going to they're going to challenge what you have to say or they're going to ask questions about what you have to say and and this is a process that I do every single day all day long it's very exhausting for someone who has my brain it's very exhausting for mental illness but it mental illness is very real but it is also very very survivable if that's a word survivable i don't know if it is i don't think so i just made it a word <laughs> survivable um you, you can survive it, but it's, it's not some magical cure. It's miracle moments all day, every day. And, and either that requires you actually finding the chemicals that help bring your brain back to a neurotypical state, back to a normal state, and you do that with a doctor that you trust who, who helps you find that, not too much, just enough to make you normal. Um, or you do it with a little extra work, and, and I have days where I don't want to do the work. <sighs> I'm tired. I, I just want her to shut up, that brain of mine. But the, the miracle moments can happen for every single person on this planet, and I can attest to it. Because when I sit in my bathtub after having an amazing day of, of helping save my girls and do an incredible event and all these things, and then I go sit in my bathtub and I don't know why I exist on this planet, and like, do I really do anything? I, I try to help people, but maybe, maybe no one really cares. Maybe if I wasn't here, it wouldn't even be noticed. Those are the thoughts that come in my mind. And then I sit there with them, and I don't judge them. So many people judge them. I don't judge them anymore. I let myself thank them, and I let them go away. That's how I deal with it. I challenge anyone who, in any walk of life, but definitely someone who suffers with mental illness, to please practice mindfulness. It is where spirituality and science come together and unite. In neuroscience, it is proven that mindful practice, uh, okay, basically there's three ways to, in the middle of your prefrontal cortex, there are subcortical fibers that when they are, when they are as they should be, they extend down and they're able to reach your amygdala. Your amygdala is the f where it fires all your fear and all the crazy stuff. So when I had that moment, that panic of PTSD moment of what happened to me, the, the embedded neural firing pattern in my amygdala was going haywire. It was like, alert, alert, alert. This is danger, danger, danger. It's the first part of the brain. The brain stem and the amygdala are the, big, the first parts of the brain that um, uh, that are formed and, and so it's your most animalistic, it's your dog brain. And 
with three things, either a, like attuned parenting when you're a kid, not all of us get that, let's face it. Uh, mostly actresses don't tend to if they're any good. Um, <laughs> the next one is, is talk therapy. And the third is mindful practice. Any of those three things will grow those subcortical fibers that spray GABA fluid onto the amygdala when it's going firing like crazy. And GABA fluid is like an extinguisher on a fire. This is the ability to bring yourself back online. Your middle of your prefrontal cortex is your humanity. It is your insight, your intuition, your moral capacity, your body regulation, your fear modulation. It covers like nine different things that make you human. You know when you have excessive levels of cortisol and adrenaline, meaning anxiety from exams for eight weeks or whatever, that part of your brain goes completely offline. Bye-bye. Bye-bye, <laughs> human. Now you're just an animal reacting like a crazy. In order to bring that back online, in order to keep it online, Mindful practice, people who have utilized the process of mindful practice for extended periods of time have been proven to be able to keep their brains online due to the plasticity of the brain, neuroplasticity, the brain alters throughout your life. So I challenge everyone in this room, anyone who, who experiences the kind of brain conversations that, that I experience, there's like a round table of them up there talking at any given moment. Do something, and it's not, oh, I'm sitting here, um. It's doing something that you love. Like, I live in LA, so people who surf, you know, like surfing, um, reading a book, doing something that takes you out of the thinker and gives you a gap of silence in your mind. Practice that, 20 minutes a day, twice a day. It's not the actual 20 minutes. Your thoughts will come and go. Don't judge them, let them come and let them go. Just don't attach to them. It's what you are doing to recreate your brain. You're rewiring your brain. And in 10 years, in five years, in two years, you'll see a difference. OK. And Great. Um, so thank you very much, Annalyn, uh, for that incredibly powerful uh, talk. And um, if any of, all, any of you would like to speak to Annalyn afterwards, uh, she'll be in the bar uh, if we have time. So please do come along. Um, but I hope uh, you had a, a great talk. And please put your hands together for Annalyn McCord. Thank you.